Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar. Um, I want to thank everyone for coming. I think we have an excellent program here for you today uh, on the topic of winning the war for innovation, a big picture look at uh, why innovation is so important today and what you and each of your organizations can do about it. Uh, my name is Chris Townsend. I'm the Senior Marketing Director at Imaginatic, and it's my pleasure today to be joined by Braden Kelly, uh, innovation experts that many of you probably know. Um, at the outside of the broadcast, I want to let everyone know that we will have the ability for you to ask questions as we go through the, the presentation. We'll have several points during uh, the talk today when we'll open up for questions. At any time when you have something you want to ask, feel free to type it into the questions panel of the GoToWebinar uh, desktop client. And um, we'll, we'll uh, answer the questions as they come up um, at each break. Um, also, for those of you who want to have the presentation materials afterwards, we will make those available um, within a short period of time after today's broadcast. And for all of those of you on the line today, we will be offering a free copy of the thought paper that Braden has written around this topic as well. Um, before we get started with the main content, uh, I'm going to give a brief overview of Imaginatic. Uh, we have been in the innovation world for more than 15 years and have had the, the blessing to work with a number of uh, large brands and major companies on helping them become sustainably innovative. Uh, we believe that innovation is one of the hallmarks of competitive advantage and, um, and the way to build a, a best uh, of industry firm today. And um, developing internal competence is critical to, to a lot of the companies you see here. And we've had the pleasure of working with and, in many cases, learning from them as we've gone through helping them with their innovation journey. We do this in a unique way, combining both best-in-class software with uh, really expertise-based consulting, coaching, and advisory. Um, we feel that innovation, if it's to scale, needs to be able to be embedded in shared systems and processes, but also there is a management component of setting the course and choosing the right direction, finding the right initiatives to focus on for innovation success on a deeper level. Um, and we help our clients on both sides of that equation. Um, as companies go through the innovation journey, we've seen several distinct parts of value that are really crucial at each state for each, for each organization in their own way. From charting the course for innovation, where you think about what's the right kind of focus, how can we develop the right kind of culture, uh, what does innovation mean for us, and, and where, are, where are we today and where do we need to go? Through actually producing ideas and innovations through the right kinds of initiatives, um, the right kinds of team setups, the, the right way of, of building process to collect and manage ideas, and so forth. And finally, building the discipline where um, de creating the institutional memory and the, the ongoing muscle for innovating as part of the daily work rhythm, um, as part of the way you interact with your customers, as part of the way that you always develop new products. Um, through certification programs, training of various kinds, um, helping to build uh, internal skills and competence in a lasting way. These together uh, help, in our experience, build a really great lasting innovation program. Um, so that's a brief overview of what we do. If you want to learn more about it, uh, we'll show my email at the end of the broadcast. Um, you can always, of course, check us out online at www.imaginatic.com. Um, and with that, it's my pleasure to introduce Braden Kelly. He'll be talking about um, some of the reasons why innovation is such a big issue today uh, and why it is so important to build that sustainable competence uh, to become a permanently innovative uh, company. Braden Kelly is a, is a thought leader for more than a decade on innovation topics. He's done uh, consulting, thought leadership. Um, he's the uh, host and producer of the popular innovationexcellence.com the Internet's leading clearinghouse for all things related to innovation, um, and a great thinker on, on everything related to how you can be innovative. And with that, Braden, uh, it's my pleasure to introduce you, and the floor is yours. Great. Thank you very much, Chris. I'm very excited to be here today, and uh, we'll go ahead and switch over, and I'll start driving from this end. Just wait a second for the switch. 
tool to give me control. Okay, there we go. Show my screen. And uh, it says I'm showing my screen. Let me just make it bigger. Okay, there we go. So I'm very excited to be here today to talk about winning the war for innovation. And before I get too deep into the content, I'd just like to say three quick things. Number one, thank you for taking time out of your busy days to join me here today. And number two, I'd like to talk with you and look forward to sharing some thoughts with you today for the next 55 minutes or so. And, and hopefully during that time, you'll find at least one or two useful ideas. So just to remind you again, at any point that you want, there's a little chat window in the lower right that you can type a question that you might have. And we'll stop for questions a few times during the presentation. And just a little bit more about who I am, if you don't know who I am. I have lived and worked in the UK and Germany and the United States, but now I live in Seattle. I'm probably best known as the author of a book called Stoking Your Innovation Bonfire that serves as a, a really great investigation of the potential barriers to innovation and how you might overcome them, but has also been picked up as a great primer for innovation as well by universities and, and companies around the world. Uh, in addition to that book, I've authored a chapter in a book called A Guide to Open Innovation and Crowdsourcing, which serves as a great introduction to those two topics. But in addition to books, I also create a lot of fun and interesting and useful tools, uh, including the nine innovation roles and the eight eyes of in infinite innovation. And as Chris mentioned, I'm a co-founder of the Innovation Excellence website. Uh, some of you may be familiar with me from Twitter. Uh, but we're not here to, to tweet too much today here. Today we're here to talk about winning the war for innovation. So we'll go ahead and jump right in with that. So as you may know already that when it comes to innovation, it's one of the, the key sources of oxygen for the business and, and keeping the business healthy and, and sustainable. And here's a great quote from Harry Burritt, Whirlpool VP of Corporate Planning and Development. In the 1980s, the watchword was quality. Today it's innovation but the two are not mutually exclusive. Now we want superior quality and faster cost reduction plus innovation all at once. And when you, when you hear a quote like that, it really makes you feel that, you know, really everybody is trying to make innovation happen now. And there's a, there's a great pressure for, for people to innovate more than ever before. And part of that pressure comes from the fact that people all around you are innovating at the same time. And those, in addition to your competitors include, uh, Customers, suppliers, even charities and governments are getting into the act and trying to, to innovate and in some cases directly competing with for-profit enterprise. And so when it comes to innovation, we have to try to think about you know, how we can structure our organizations to, to consume more innovation and make more innovation happen. And in order to, to make our organizations more innovative and to create more innovation at the back end, uh, one of the first steps that you have to undergo is to, to create a common language for innovation so that everybody in the organization knows what you mean when you're talking about innovation. And a definition can be one of those things. And, and my definition for innovation is that innovation transforms the useful seeds of invention into solutions valued above every existing alternative. And then, of course, makes them widely adopted. Because without adoption, then what you really have is just a, a useful piece of technology or a useful invention. That, that really hasn't uh, captured the hearts and minds of the, the consumers. So another thing that we know when it comes to innovation is that you can't get comfortable. As soon as your company feels that it's on top of the world and has achieved great success, then that's often when you're ripest for the fall. And so we have to be careful about falling asleep at the switch because if we spend too much time standing on one place, we're likely to get run over from behind. We can see that happening as we look backwards into history with companies like AltaVista that was the leader in internet search until Google came along and ate their cookies. Companies like CompuServe that was transcended as the leader of the internet space by uh, America Online and then Yahoo and then MySpace. And of course now Facebook is looked to as one of the leaders of the online space. And I would predict in the next 10 years or so that some company that we probably haven't even heard of will come along and supplant Facebook as the leader of the online space. As we look at other spaces, including the, the personal computer space, in the early 80s, uh, Apple was quite an uh, influencer there with the Apple II and the Macintosh before IBM came along with the, the PC. Uh, and Dell came along and took over the PC market. 
only to be supplanted at the, the server end by a compact and the, the consumer end by HP, uh, who's now having its own troubles. Then we have interesting situations like Blockbuster, who is disrupted not just by one, but by two different companies with two completely different business models. So as you look across the space and as you look across a lot of different industries, you really suddenly start to feel that, yes, the pace of innovation is accelerating. And my friend Speed Racer here is, is there with good reason because as you look at some of the consumption trends of different technologies that have come to, to bear over the, the last several decades and centuries, uh, this not only is innovation spreading, fast, spreading faster, but the adoption is, is coming along faster as well. Part of that is because we have improved communication systems with things like the internet to help people find out about new products and services much faster. Uh, but part of that is also that at the same time we can communicate about our products faster and make people aware of them faster. Our competitors become aware faster as well. And so then you end up with a lot more products being launched in the new market spaces much more quickly than ever before. But companies are not the only ones that we have to worry about in competition. I'll just go ahead and share this with you here. So companies now must worry about facing competition from their customers. In fact, Eric von Hippel, Jerome T.J. Dijon, and Stephen Flowers recently published in Management Science that British consumers spent more on creating innovation in the consumer products category in 2007 than the total corporate R&D spend on consumer products that same year by more than an estimated $1.5 billion. So it's not just companies that we have to worry about now. We have to worry about our customers competing against us too, because it doesn't take as much to move something from the idea stage to the, the market stage as much as it used to. And part of that is that there's a whole host of companies out there that stand ready to help people take something from mine to market. Companies like Evergreen IP that at the same time they work with Big, big giant conglomerates like the Clorox company and Avery to run their open innovation programs or help them with their own open innovation programs. They also help customers uh, with ideas bring things to market like Sandox. Then we have companies like Quirky that is at the, the same time built a community for people to share their ideas and get feedback from the community on their ideas. Uh, they've also formed a lot of retail partnerships with big retailers to provide distribution channels for the ideas that the community feels have the best chance of being successful. Then you have companies like Kickstarter that have popped up to help people raise money directly from the crowd for their promising ideas. Uh, but there's also other sites like this as well, including Indiegogo. But it's not just crowd crowdfunding and some of the, the development opportunities that exist with, with Quirky and others. On the back end, it's become much easier than ever before to find people to make your product or make it actually real in the marketplace. So you have organizations like Alibaba that have thousands of suppliers all over the world that can help make your idea real and get it produced. So here's a quote that I really like from Jeff Bezos. Invention has become second nature at Amazon, and in my view, the team's pace of innovation is even accelerating. And when we look at acceleration when we look at the, the plethora of products out there in the marketplace. Uh, an example I like to talk about is Cheerios. Cheerios has been around for you know 70 plus years and in the first 35 years you can see that there was only one version of Cheerios and in the last 35 years they've launched more than 13 new varieties and most of those have been in the last three to five years. So as we look at the, the accelerating pace of innovation, and we look at how the product life cycle matures over time, it's become increasingly important that during especially the introduction and growth phases that we focus on trying to identify what we can learn after we launch the product and try to feed that back into the product development process for the next version of the product that's probably coming right behind it. So with that, I'd like to stop just for a second and, and, and take a breath and, and see, Chris, if we've gotten any questions so far. Yeah, Braden, we do. Um, thanks, everyone, for sending your questions in so far. Again, a reminder, if you want to ask a question, uh, type it into the questions panel on the GoToWebinar client on your desktop. And uh, yeah, Braden, we do have a, a couple that have come in already. Um, the first one is around innovation metrics. Uh, there's um, 
if someone wants to know, well, what innovation metrics do they use? Um, from Imaginetics perspective, I think um, there's a pretty, pretty simple answer to that, and that is it depends. Um, and that's not meant to be an equivocation, but, but really a, an, an understanding that innovation can come from a lot of different areas. And so, um, you know, we would tend to work with, with someone to, to define um, what kind of innovation they have operationally, what kind of results do they expect, and therefore what kind of metrics do they need to put in place. There are some cases where metrics are very qualitative, sometimes they're very quantitative, um, but in any case, we, we, we try and tie that to the business objectives that the innovation is meant to, to go along with. Um, Braden, I, I don't know if you have any, any thoughts on, on your side as well. Well, I think that there has been a lot written about metrics, and, and I think that if you, you know, do a search on innovation excellence or a search on the Internet, you'll find several articles about innovation metrics. Uh, some of the more popular ones are new products launched in the, in the last, you know, three, three years and revenue from new products. Um, some people also look at the number of ideas that they have submitted into a tool they might be using uh, to gather ideas. But I think that really what people have to do is think about what defines success for their innovation program. Is that, you know, the number of new products that you're bringing into the marketplace? Is that moving from number three to number one in, in a core product area? Is that um, trying to increase employee engagement and retention by giving people uh, a way to, to be heard and a way to contribute to the business that's outside their ordinary job? I think there's a lot of ways that you can uh, have a successful innovation program and the, the first step is to think about what success looks like for you and then think about how to measure that success. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah, good. Um, okay, we have another question. You talked a little bit about the um, accelerating pace of innovation. How does this affect um, individual people in the workplace? You know, if, if, if people are at their jobs every day, um, do, do they feel that accelerating pace or should they? I think that they probably do feel that that pace because it, it what it feels like oftentimes is increasing pressure. Uh, it seems like every day in, in your space that one of your competitors is coming out with a new product uh, and that product might have a, a feature that yours doesn't have. Um, you know, it's not of course all about features, but I think that what we see is uh, as part of the accelerating pace of innovation is that companies are working very hard to get faster at their ability to, to launch new products into the marketplace and in many cases are launching more products more quickly to try and not only protect their, their turf but to extend their turf as well and so I think what the, where that leaves the individual employee is the opportunity to make contributions of how to improve existing products and services or to identify areas where the company might go where they have credibility with customers and have a real market opportunity. Okay, yeah, yeah, very true. Um, let's see, we're getting a bunch of questions coming in here. Um, another one is, is around innovation in supply chains. Um, and, uh, you know, I guess they, they're asking a question about the, you know, it, what's, the, what's the social focus um, in relation to um, innovation in the supply chain. I'm not sure if this is really a question about social responsibility or or more about um, the social nature of innovation. I mean, certainly um, at, at Imaginatic, we would we would say that the, the the collaborative nature of innovation is a real hallmark of of how innovation works today. Um, and and certainly in a supply chain, being able to uh, have a social focus in terms of collaborating to to, to solve problems and find new opportunities is critical. Um, Braden, what, what would you say about innovation in, in supply chains? Well, I think that when it comes to, to innovation, it is a highly collaborative process, and I think that it's also focused very heavily on, on value as, as I look at it. So I, I think that in addition to trying to create value for customers, we also have to look at how we help them access that value and also how we translate that value for people and how we really help them see how it fits into their lives, uh, the, the, the innovation that we're trying to bring to them. And so as we look at the, the supply chain, our supply chains are somebody that we should be collaborating with to try to see what new capabilities uh, that they might be able to, to bring to bear to the organization. 
Uh, we also should be looking at how we might be able to get access before our competitors to interesting and cutting edge uh, potential supplies that you know we would like to have before other people. And I think that there's an opportunity for everybody up and down the supply chain to innovate and the, the, the people that assemble everything at the end just have the, the greatest opportunity to figure out what the, the right components are to integrate together and to design the greatest value for the customer. But I think that, that if you're not already trying to work with suppliers to drive innovation, then you should be. Okay, great. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Um, one, we're, so we're getting, we're getting a lot of questions here. I'm going to take one more and then I think uh, we'll, we'll keep going with the presentation for now. For all those that don't have their question answered at this first break, we'll try and get to them in the second. Um, so do please keep those questions coming. Uh, last question here, how are companies managing and prioritizing um, their, their different innovation resources? Um, maybe we'll get into this a bit more later, but I, I don't know if there's a, a comment right now around um, sort of making those choices, where to, where to put your, your priorities. Well, we will talk a little bit later about one example of how one organization fights against the struggle that most companies have, which is to balance the demand for operational excellence with trying to make innovation excellence happen. I, I think that it's very hard for most organizations to really make time for innovation and because everybody's focused on their day-to-day -day job and, and trying to make things happen for the organization and keep it running efficiently and profitably. And so I think that that's definitely one of the, the greatest challenges of organizations and it's something that lots of different people in the organization are going to have to work together to solve because ultimately what we want to have happen in successful organizations is find a way to staff for innovation so that as people have great ideas and come together to form great innovation teams, that we have a way to not only backfill their, their roles in keeping the, the machinery humming, but that we also have the ability to uh, find space for those people to work and uh, find the financial resources for their project to be funded and the, the communication resources to help uh, start crafting those transfer those uh, translation stories and so there's a lot of resources that have to come to bear in trying to solve that that critical question of how do we make time for innovation but it is it is possible we will look at one one example coming up soon okay good thanks and with that I think that's a good transition to um, to shift back over again for anyone that has asked a question we haven't answered yet we'll try and get to those at the next break um, Braden one and I toss it back to you okay great thanks Chris so let's jump into our next topic, which is looking at making innovation a core competence. So when I talk about making innovation a core competence or trying to embed innovation within your organization or trying to create innovation excellence or to pursue innovation excellence, there's sort of four core areas that I like to talk about. Number one is leadership and structure. Number two is processes and tools. Number three are people and skills. And number four is culture and values. And there was a, a recent survey that came out recently from Hill and Knowlton of 175 companies where executives cited promoting continuous innovation as the most difficult goal for their company to get right. And to quote, structurally many companies just aren't set up to deliver continuous innovation. And that's one of the, the core problems that companies face in trying to make innovation a reality is that many companies look at innovation from a project standpoint or from a burning platform standpoint and don't look at it from a systemic approach and trying to really embed it as a core competence of the organization. And if you fail to take a systemic and approach to innovation, if you don't create a system for innovation, then it, it has no chance of really be, being sustainable or lasting for the long term. So if you look at an innovation system, you know, it can include all kinds of different things, uh, including matching your, your innovation vision to the corporate vision. Uh, but also having an innovation and strategy and goals to go with it. Uh, and then there's all kinds of other things that you have to consider, everything from insight generation to idea collaboration to funding and staffing and uh, managing an innovation portfolio. All these things uh, and, and potentially others have to come together to form a complete system if you want to have any chance of making it sustainable. On the vision side, Jack Welch had a brilliant quote that, that says, good business leaders create a vision, 
articulate the vision, passionately own the vision, and relentlessly drive it to completion. And this is true both for your innovation vision and, of course, your organizational vision. And I'd like to share a quote with you from A.G. Lapley, the former CEO of Procter & Gamble, who said that innovation is risky, but it's not random. Innovators have a disciplined invention process. They may not be able to articulate it, and sometimes the eureka moment happens in the shower, but it stems from a disciplined process. And that's one of the, the key things to remember is that, you know, whether you're trying to invent a better mousetrap or trying to uh, come up with the, the next great service, that, you know, there may be some eureka moments, but it's the disciplined process that captures those eureka moments, accumulates them together, and pushes the project further over time. Uh, one eureka moment by itself will not make an innovation. It will help you move forward, but it's the disciplined process that helps to identify the best ideas, to fund them, to staff them, and to make sure that things are in place to translate an invention into an innovation. If we look at another quote from A.G. Lapley, you need creativity and invention, but until you can connect that creativity to the customer in the form of a product or a service that meaningfully changes their lives, I would argue that you don't yet have innovation. And that's the key is that not only does, does innovation have to create value above every existing alternative, but it also has to meaningfully change people's lives in a, in an, an, a way that's strong enough that they're willing to go through the, the pain of change. So let's look at innovation vision at, at P&G and, and how that sort of really translates across vision, strategy, and goals. So, so if we look at uh, a starting point, P&G said that they wanted to source 50% of the company's in, innovation from the outside. And that's, that's kind of the, the goal, kind of, I mean, let's work backwards a little bit. But why do they want to achieve innovation from outside? Well, there's a famous Bill Joy quote that says, there are always more smart people outside your company than within it. And I think that that's true. Uh, we, every organization has a lot of smart people, but to think that all the smart people in the world live within your organization can only limit what you can achieve. Uh, so here's, here's a quote from Chris Kuhn, who used to head up P&G's Open Innovation uh, program, which was called, which is called Connect and Develop. P&G has incredibly talented employees, employees who are proud of the work they do. Moving from only invented at P&G to proudly found elsewhere required a change in mindset. It was important that employees realize that Connect and Develop was not another name for downsizing and outsourcing jobs, but instead a strategy to ensure sustained business growth for the company. And that's the, one of the main reasons why organizations are opening up and soliciting ideas from their employees or soliciting ideas from their customers or their suppliers or their partners is because not only do a lot of smart people live outside their organization, um, but it really helps to ensure that some of the, the best ideas um, from around the world come, come to them and help to sustain the growth for the company. So if we look at how vision, strategy, and goals come together, uh, if P&G started with an innovation vision of reaching outside the company's own R&D department for innovation. Uh, the strategy create a formal program called Connect and Develop to focus on this vision, and the goal to source 50% of the company's innovation from the outside, which they have, they have met and they, they do continue to meet. Uh, one more thing from Chris, P&G was looking at entering Sonic Toothbrush Market. We considered doing it ourselves, but projected three to five years before going to market. Instead, we partnered with one of the largest home electronic product companies in Japan and went to market in a fraction of the time and cost. So there's a lot of opportunities to not only make innovation happen within your organization, but by working with people outside your organization and not only come up with better ideas or, or other great ideas, but also at the same time to potentially cut the time to market. So Chris. Chris? Uh, there you are, Brayden, hi. Yeah. Um, so we do have some more questions um, that have come in during this uh, the, ne the next part. Let me jump right into them. Um, first one, so there is um, a lot of innovation activity, of course, is done in stage gates uh, where you're moving, moving ideas and projects through a, a pipeline with, with discrete stages along the way of the process. 
Um, if, if we have these accelerating innovation needs and pressures, going back a little bit um, in, in your talk, uh, how does that mesh with this sort of defined systematic process? Can, can, can they coexist? So I think that they can coexist. There are lots of organizations out there that use the StageGate methodology. It's, it's very popular. It's a good way to try to control uh, the, the process of commercializing things and, and making sure that you end up with a, a sustainable product at the, the end of it, a sustainable product being something that's, that's hopefully quite profitable. Um, but I think that when it comes to innovation and meshing it with the stage gate process, what a lot of companies do is they, they have a defined innovation process up front for gathering ideas, for evolving them, for uh, selecting them, for funding them. And then at the end of that, then they plug it into their, their stage gate process for the, the commercialization part so that they can make sure that they're going to do it as efficiently as possible and that all the, the, the proper parties are, are pulled in to make sure that they can operationalize it and make it profitably. Uh, and so I think that the two can exist uh, together and I think that many organizations, they do. Uh, the one thing that you, of course, want to be careful of and to keep in mind is that uh, oftentimes when you're trying to innovate, the, the ideas tend to be more on the, the complex side, especially if you're trying to disrupt a new market or you're aiming for something more than, than a small incremental innovation. And so you oftentimes have to have some level of flexibility in your process in case you run into a, a key hurdle that you weren't expecting to, to pop it out of the process and then maybe bring it back in later. Okay, yeah, that's, that's good advice. Um, so we have another question about within the organization who is what are the roadblocks and specifically what or who is blocking innovation so in those in those companies that struggle where are the where are the where are the roadblocks either stuff or people so there are a lot of different roadblocks to innovation that can come up uh, in in my book Stoke Innovation Bonfire I identified 10 different major areas where people tend to get stuck and the, the book is really about really identifying barriers and, and trying to overcome them. Um, and one of the things that I did for the book was to, to do a survey and uh, gave people several options. And then the number one option that people chose for the, the biggest blocker to innovation was organizational psychology. And in, in probing a little further, oftentimes what that comes down to be is uh, oftentimes a fear of failure or uh, low risk tolerance in the organization or just people feeling that it's somehow impossible to make it happen in their organization because of the, the bureaucracy or the other items that they're going to have to fight against um, in their organization. And I, and I think that a lot of the, the blockers when it comes to innovation can include things like the success of the organization. Uh, if an organization has become successful selling a certain product or service and is, has based their, their reputation and their brand on it, um, or if people within that organization have developed their, their center of power or their center of importance from leading that, that organization, uh, then there's a good chance that they may fight against it. Any, anytime you, you're talking about a person that's found importance for doing something and, and success for doing something, uh, oftentimes they're going to fight against anything that undermines that or that threatens to displace it. And that's, that's true both on a, on a personal level and even on a, a, a brand or a, a business level. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Thanks. Um, so we actually have a, a bit of a story here. Someone, someone typed a story in as a question. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to paraphrase and summarize here. They're saying that they have a CEO very dedicated to innovation. Um, they've actually hired a team, including this person, called the Design Thinking and Innovation Team. Um, but um, this this new team has met incredible resistance throughout the rest of the company, um, and um, they're they're struggling for you know to be able to get through those those barriers essentially. Um, what what specific suggestions would you have for, for how they could do that? Well, I think that when it comes to situations like that, when it comes to how we look at innovation management, we have to to remember that. It, or at least in my view, that innovation management is a collection of all the great management practices that we've accumulated over the last, you know, 
several hundred years or thousands of years. And so there's a lot of great information out, about, out there about managing change, and innovation is, is all about change, uh, and one of the, the components to innovation management is managing change. Uh, and so I would, I would say to, to look at uh, a lot of the great literature out there about managing the, the change process. Uh, there's also a really fun video on the, the site that we posted in the last week uh, about the, the transition from the, uh, the Stone Age to the Bronze Age. Uh, and that might be useful in some way, if nothing else, to hopefully give you a good laugh. But I, I think that when it comes to change, we really have to try to be very collaborative in how we approach things and really involve people as early as possible in the, the potential change and, and getting feedback up front, even if we don't intend or just can't possibly incorporate it all, uh, so that people feel like they've been, they've been heard and have been part of the process. Uh, but then also, as I mentioned in the last question, there's just a natural tendency in a lot of organizations to fight against the new because it threatens the old. Um, and, you know, the, it, that's oftentimes why uh, innovation or innovators, I like to say, or the, the word innovator is very close to the word invader. Uh, you could almost mishear them over the over a bad telephone connection and so uh, that's oftentimes how people look at innovation is as in, an invasion and so we have to remember that and to plan for that and to communicate around that so that people understand that the reasoning for the pursuit of innovation and what we hope to achieve uh, and hopefully uh, especially in organizations that have been growth challenged uh, over the last few years uh, that will help with the, the scarcity mentality that might exist in the organization. Mm, great, yeah, cool. Um, let's see, I, we're going to take one more question now and then I think uh, we'll go back to the to the presentation and keep ourselves on time. Um, there's another very specific um, story here from someone in the audience who is, has been involved in an innovation program at, at a major company that's in the process of being acquired. Um, and they already know that the acquiring company doesn't have any formal innovation program. Um, and this, this person is wondering how, how they can go about, how they can best promote the virtues of their innovation program in this context. So I, th I think that when it comes to an organization being acquired, it's not unheard of. Uh, that there are cases where uh, something useful and valuable from the organization being acquired is implemented across the acquiring organization, the bigger organization. And so I think that, if, that it is possible that if they've created a really great innovation program in the, the or smaller organization being acquired, that it could be translated to the larger organization. But for that to happen, I would say the first thing is uh, to try to find the, the revolutionaries within the larger organization, the people that are really passionate about innovation in the larger organization, the people that have been fighting the good fight but maybe that haven't gotten traction, um, and to, to sit down for coffee with them and, or fly out to meet them or whatever it might take to, to really uh, understand what the, the climate is in the, in the acquiring organization and uh, what things that they've tried and the barriers that they've faced and how the the two uh, interests, the aligned interests of the passion for innovation and, and making it a sustained capability in the organization can be combined and how you can work together across these two combined organizations to make a, a, a newer, bigger uh, effort possible across the combined organization. Great. Yeah, totally. Um, all right. To keep things moving, Braden, I'm going to turn it back over to you. Um, please, everyone, keep those questions coming. We'll do our best to get, to get them answered as we go through. Uh, so, Braden, back to you. Great. Thanks, Chris. So, let's talk about embedding innovation a little bit more, and, and I want to share a quote from Moises Noreña at Whirlpool. Uh, Whirlpool would not be where it is today if innovation wasn't an explicit strategy at the highest level of the organization, supported and driven by our CEO. If it wasn't because innovation was considered an organizational competency, that includes a common process, a part of the enterprise agenda and of the strategic planning process, our pipeline would not be where it is. This is what has made innovation sustainable at Whirlpool Corporation. 
And if we look at the, the next slide, which shows the innovation infrastructure at Whirlpool, you'll see from the very top to the very bottom, the innovation goes through all the different aspects of the organization. So it starts at the top with a CEO that they think of as the chief innovation officer, followed by a global VP of innovation and margin realization, a uh, global director of innovation, then they have regional vice presidents of innovation, regional, regional centers of excellence around innovation uh, that the business, use, business units participate in. And across the company, they have over 500 part-time iMentors. Uh, thousands and thousands of people in the organization have been trained in innovation methods. And all the innovation teams have this structure to plug into and, and to get support from. So from the very top of the organization to the very bottom, over the last more than a decade, they've been working very hard to try to um, make and keep innovation and embedded capability of the organization. And it's reflected in the, the turnaround in the organization uh, after they started this pursuit. So let's, let's talk, as, as promised, about uh, some of the challenges of balancing the demands of the regular day-to-day -day business with the, the demands for innovation and, and making innovation happen when time doesn't exist. So, so as you can see on this, this picture, this is kind of what innovation looks like in most organizations. It's something that you're asked to do oftentimes in addition to your day job, and it's up to you to figure out how to find time for it, whether that's trying to do it while you're riding an exercise bicycle or otherwise. Uh, Intuit is taking a slightly different approach to this this challenge, uh, building upon the start of Google and 3M with their percent time programs, which, as the joke goes, that uh, sure, you have percent time at Google as long as you can do it on Saturday or Sunday. Um, they've tried to find a better way to make innovation pursuit both more collaborative and um, more manageable for, uh, for management. Uh, so what innovation uh, what, what Intuit does around making time for innovation is they encourage collaborative, what I like to call, innovation vacations. And this means that they do have a, the percent time concept, but instead of just having it as such, they allow people to accumulate their percent time and then schedule it with uh, colleagues to pursue uh, promising ideas. So this makes it possible for managers to uh, plan for it. Uh, and opens up the possibility in, on a broader scale potentially for HR to staff for it. Uh, so in the same way that HR has to consider uh, sick time and PTO and vacation and paid holidays and all these other things and how we're going to staff to make sure that we have the appropriate number of people in the organization. Um, when you start looking at allowing uh, people to take time off to, to work on innovation projects and, and doing it in a way that can be scheduled like this, then then HR can also try to staff for it. Uh, one other thing from this picture that we have up on the screen, this is uh, into its wall of innovation fame at their uh, headquarters lunchroom in Mountain View, California. And if you look at the, the wall of fame, you'll notice that the, all the, I think one picture on here on the wall of fame uh, is more than one person. So they, they really do work hard to make innovation a collaborative effort and to reward people as, as teams and to make innovation a team sport. Um, and then uh, I love this quote from William McKnight, the former CEO of 3M, that if you put fences around people, you get sheep. And so I really believe that we must find a way to strike a balance between what employees need to do for the organization and what they want to do for the organization. Otherwise, human capital is being wasted, flushed down the drain. We're all hired into an organization to fulfill a particular role, a role that the organization needs to be fulfilled. Uh, but that doesn't mean that those are the only skills and abilities that we have as, as human beings or as contributors to that organization. And the smart organization, especially moving forward, is going to find a way to strike that balance of not only having an employee fill the, the role that they they fill within the organizational machinery, but also allow them the, the freedom and the flexibility to contribute in ways that might even be more impactful uh, than the role they were hired into. Uh, so this is what operational excellence looks like. When you manage for the maximum output, it, oftentimes you don't 
consider the, the inputs together and what, and what they need. Uh, and so as you start to pursue uh, an innovation effort that might include uh, soliciting ideas from your employees, it, it wouldn't be unheard of to, to have very few of them venture afield uh, initially because they may have you know, questions around your commitment to the innovation effort. But if you do stay committed and if you do work hard to uh, implement the ideas of your employees and the other people that you try to pull into your innovation process, eventually you'll get people uh, searching farther afield and contributing at a, a higher level and a more sustainable level and um, really pulling back some really great inspiration from the ability to go farther afield. So let's, let's take a, a, a attack and, and move in a slightly different direction and talk about the, the need of both individuals and organizations to, to reinvent and reimagine. Uh, otherwise, you know, face the question of will you innovate or die. So during the last downturn and, and every downturn that comes along or, or just you know from time to time we all face this potential challenge that we might have to reinvent ourselves and go in a new direction and that's true for individuals and it's true for companies too and we've seen we've seen companies that have failed to reinvent themselves, failed to react to market changing conditions and have gone out of business. People like Borders and Circuit City uh, companies that like Silicon Graphics and Polaroid and Schwinn that have faced uh, a lot of challenges and have missed changes in the market. Uh, but then you also see companies like Kodak and Fujifilm that are in the exact same industry that's facing the exact same challenges, but on the left you have Kodak with losses of a billion dollars and nearly a billion dollars in 2011. And on the right you have Fujifilm uh, with profits of nearly a billion dollars in 2010. And so just to, to share uh, an interesting piece of information from an Economist article that, that sort of highlights some of the, the difference and why these two outcomes are so drastically different. Uh, Fujifilm, too, saw omens of digital doom as early as the 1980s. It developed a three-pronged strategy to squeeze as much money out of the film business as possible, to prepare for the switch to digital, and to develop new, new business lines. And their CEO said, it was a painful experience, but to see the situation as it was, nobody could survive. So we had to reconstruct the business model. And lots of organizations have survived and continue to thrive from reinventing themselves. We saw IBM uh, reinvent itself as a services company, uh, selling off their PC business. But, and we've seen HP you know, thinking about doing that, but then changing their minds. Ultimately, I believe, because they, they realized that a lot of their brand equity and a lot of their uh, employee passion lies around the, the invention and, and creating new things. And it'll be interesting to see how that survives with a, a new CEO, with Meg Whitman at, at the, the helm. I think that she'll probably lean towards cost cutting and, and may make the company more profitable, but it'll be interesting to see if she can maintain that, that culture of invention within HP and can get them on the, the path to uh, success. But it's not just HP that's facing challenges uh, because of some of the, the changes in longer life cycles for technology. We see retailers like Best Buy that are, are well known for some of their efforts to involve employees in the innovation process uh, facing challenges as well. And it'll be interesting to see how they uh, fare coming out the other side. But um, lots of other companies have reinvented themselves. We see Park moving from Xerox Park to becoming Park and uh, taking on additional clients outside the company. Uh, BMW Design Works has done a similar thing. They don't not don't just design uh, BMW automobiles and contribute design to the BMW Group, but they also do things like help with John Deere tractors and other design efforts for other companies. Uh, we see Microsoft toying with reinvention by um, launching Windows Azure and Microsoft Office 365, uh, putting two of their, their big franchises, their two big pillars at risk, uh, but at the same time trying to, to reinvent and make sure that they're there in the, the cloud services space in case that does supplant their traditional uh, package product business. But my favorite company uh, when it comes to reinvention and experimentation is Amazon. They're, they're an e-tailer, of course, but uh, when you look at them and all the different things that they've done and all the different things that they try, they don't really limit themselves to one definition of what they might be, but are constantly experimenting, constantly trying things. 
I came across another thing the other day that I didn't even know about called Amazon Tote. Uh, apparently, the, the experiment was that uh, instead of just allowing people to schedule times for delivery uh, using its Amazon Fresh service for when the, the truck might be in the neighborhood, you could order things up to a couple days before the day that the truck would be in, in your neighborhood and, and have them delivered. It's not something that survived, but Amazon is always trying things and always experimenting. Uh, even companies like Apple are experimenting and trying things. Apple has very consciously been messaging around its Apple TV product that it's a hobby and not pushing it as hard as they push some of their other products. It's still grown to an installed base of 6.8 million units now, uh, but you compare that to one quarter worth of iPhone sales and you see how small it is in comparison. Part of the reason that they do this is because that they, they know that the really that the consumer isn't quite ready for this type of product, isn't ready on a broad scale to adopt it. And so rather than spending a lot of money on marketing and uh, making a huge investment that may not pay off, they're making a smaller experiment and a smaller investment to get enough customer learning to keep things moving forward and, and making it a success in the long run when, when people are ready. So that takes us to the last question break. If we have more questions we want to field, Chris? Yeah, definitely. Um, lots, of, lots of questions still coming in. Um, let's try and get to a few of those now. Um, first one, if you want your culture inside the company to be more innovation-centric, how can you influence or, 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 or train that uh, within the company? So I think that people um, have to see results. You know, people look at actions more than words. And so the first thing that you have to do if you want to have a more innovative culture is to start allowing more innovation to happen. Uh, to start funding projects uh, for innovation, uh, to start taking ideas and then actually executing those ideas from employees, uh, to, to really make sure that it's visible that innovation is something that every employee can be a part of. Otherwise, people will just assume that it's the job of someone else. Uh, and so that, that's where I would say you, you have to start, and, and it's not something that will happen overnight. Hmm. Um, and um, another question, so a bit broader. So, if you're starting on an innovation journey, your organization, do, do you start with just getting the ideas, or do you need to start with the bigger goals? Well, I think you need to start with the vision first. What is it ex exactly that you want to achieve with innovation? Why are you pursuing innovation? What do you hope to achieve? Um, looking at the strategy and, and what you are going to focus on versus what you're not going to focus on. Um, and then, you know, the goals can help you define how you're going to get there in, in some senses and the strategy too. So I think that any innovation journey begins first with a common language of innovation, and that includes the definition, but it also includes all the other ways that you're going to message to the the community, whether your community is just employees or something broader than that, about how you're going to message around innovation, uh, what it what it means, who's you know who it's meant for, um, all these things uh, that that form a, a common language of innovation, and then you build a vision, strategy, and goals, and then you start to build some of the other infrastructure to support innovation, um, things like setting aside separate funding, um, making sure that you have uh, resources available to run your new innovation system, um, then then you probably are going to, if you're going to start soliciting ideas, um, make sure that you, you have a tool for managing that and for uh, helping people collaborate and make them better um, because it's not just about gathering the ideas. Uh, you really want to help people connect and um, make them better. So it's collecting the ideas and connecting the ideas uh, and connecting the people to make them stronger. So there's there's a lot of things that you uh, that need to be done, especially initially in getting started on your innovation journey. Okay, that makes a lot of sense. Um, I think just because we're we're short on time, uh, we got to wrap it up with the last segment. So I'm gonna I'm gonna toss it back, and we'll see if we can get a few more questions in at the end if we have if we have any remaining minutes. Um, so Braden, I'll, I'll I'll toss it back to you again. Okay, great. Thanks, Chris. So let's just finish up with some some final thoughts then. Uh, so when it comes to 
trying to win the war for innovation, I think one one thing or the, the thing that you need to keep in mind the most is that you always have to be probing. You always have to be testing to see both what's possible and but then also gathering inspiration from not only your industry but lots of other industries out there to see what might be possible. Um, and so that means that you have to be out there scouting. And I like to talk about building a global sensing network that gathers not only trends but also inspiration and insight from people all through your organization and also all around the world and, and not just your industry but other industries as well. Uh, and as you look to, to innovate, there's a, I'll share with you this, this quick checklist of 10, 10 things to think about in measuring your innovation readiness or to prepare you to be ready for innovation. Uh, number one is conducting an innovation audit to see where you're at. Number two, define what innovation means for your organization. Number three, create a common language of innovation. Number four, define your innovation vision. Number five, define your innovation strategy. Number six, define your innovation goals. Number seven, allocate money to fund innovation projects. And I'll let you read the rest for yourself. Uh, and we'll, we'll go on to the, the next slide. And then when you do an innovation audit, one of the things that can help you do is see where you lie on an innovation maturity model to see whether you're reactive, like most organizations sitting on the left, or whether you're, you know, probably an organization I haven't met yet where you're uh, at level five and continuously improving not, not only your ability to innovate, but your innovation system itself. So what are the what are successful companies' innovation really look like? What are some of the characteristics? Well, I would say that number one, they focus on acceleration. They focus on trying to remove barriers that can help them go faster and, and make them more successful. Uh, number two, they recognize that risk is involved, that some eggs will get broken in this, this process to achieve both operational excellence and innovation excellence at the same time. Uh, and they focus on learning from any failures that do occur. Number three, they create an innovation system that both supports uh, an infrastructure for uh, continuous innovation, but also for uh, helping the organization learn faster and innovate faster. Uh, number four, they recognize it's about the people. Number five, they know that you can't do it all yourself. And that may include involving your employees or even your customers, suppliers, or other people in your innovation efforts. Number six, they understand that big ideas start small. And, and that's one of the keys to remember when it comes to innovation is that you might be looking at five different projects and they all look promising. And, and really, early on, you don't know which one of those five, if any, are going to turn out to be the whopper, the, the, the big giant success. And so it's very important that you have a balanced portfolio of innovation ideas with different risk profiles and different time horizons to make sure that you not only have um, innovation coming through your pipeline at all times, but that you also have um, some planning around the eventuality of some succeeding and some failing. And then number seven, they believe that innovation can come from anywhere, and they believe really that innovation is a team sport. And that's one of the things that I highlight in my book and in a lot of the things that I write about. Um, and it's the reason that I developed the nine innovation roles as a tool uh, that you can, can read more about. Uh, because we're all innovative, we're just innovative in our own ways, and successful teams need a number of roles coming together to, to achieve their innovation success. So with that, I'll just throw up a couple of URLs that you might want to capture and, and make use of. Uh, you can grab our, our newsletter, uh, or you can, if you want, for free, in, integrate uh, our great articles on innovation excellence into your corporate portal or your innovation portal. So that just leaves one final question, which is, are you willing to take, take the risk? Are you willing to take the leap, the plunge? Are you willing to, to throw yourself out there and pursue innovation? Because uh, somebody will catch you. So with that, I'll just uh, say thank you very much. And if we do have time for any final questions, I'm happy to take them. Yeah, Braden, thanks. That's that's great. Um, I do I do think we have a couple minutes for any any of the folks who can can stay on a little bit because uh, we do have more questions that that we haven't been able to answer yet. Um, so let me go into one right here. Um, you've given some some great examples of, of people who have reinvented themselves, companies who reinvented themselves. What are some of the how-to um, tips that you would give on that? How do you actually do that? 
So I think that number one, when it comes to reinventing yourself, you want to do it early, um, which means you have to admit that you're you face a problem or that you're facing a, a coming sea change in your industry that's that's going to change its its profitability or your, at least your your company's profitability. Uh, so you want to do it early while you're still making money, so that you have the opportunity to to, to think about and look across to try to identify where you might want to invest um, money. Are there other industries that you have a lot of skills that you might want to go into instead? Uh, or are there products and services that you want to try to um, create that would be very innovative and might help get you back in the game or help you create a new game? Uh, and, and so those are some of the things that I would say that when it comes to reinvention, early commitment and um, um, pursuit of multiple possibilities. Okay, great, great, great. Um, and uh, we'll, we'll just take one more uh, now and apologies to those that have asked questions that haven't been answered. Um, this one is, in war you need at least two sides. You've talked about the war for innovation. So what is it that's at war with innovation? So I would say that in many organizations the, the war for innovation excellence is fighting against operational excellence. Um, oftentimes in many organizations people pursuing operational excellence see innovation as a distraction, they see it as a cost, they see it as something that sounds really great but doesn't pay off or, or takes time away from making the, the core business successful. And so, so on the one hand you, you have a sort of a tension, I would say, between the entrepreneurial mindset and the executive mindset in an organization. You have the, the executives trying to make sure the trains run on time, and then you have the entrepreneurs that are always trying to figure out new ways of transporting people that might not be trained. Uh, and so you have to strike that balance between those two mindsets. Uh, and at the same time, I think that you also, uh, as we look at the war for innovation, we're, we're seeing an increased competition not just amongst companies but also amongst countries and even cities when it comes to innovation and trying to uh, attract innovators and entrepreneurs to particular geographies and I think that will continue especially as we uh, with the increasing urbanization I think we'll see cities as an increasing factor in the overall uh, innovation landscape and then I think that also as we look at the war for innovation one of the things that we're we're talking about that we didn't spend much time on as, as being part of the war uh, would be the fact that uh, you want to be the, the partner of choice and one of the things that is important is to think about is that there's only a, a there's, there's a fixed capacity out there for people to participate in innovation programs uh, so if you're the the first and the best and you cap set yourself up as the partner of choice in your industry over your competition that gives you an advantage That's great, Braden. Thanks a lot. Um, really appreciate the time today. Uh, great answers and um, great presentation. Uh, we have gotten so many questions and comments uh, from, from the audience. Uh, it's really great to see. Um, thanks, everyone, for coming. Before we wrap up, I just want to mention one or two things really quick. Um, so you should be able to see my screen in just a second. Um, as I mentioned at the beginning, the recording of today's webinar will be available for download later this week. Um, along with it, you'll be able to get a copy of the slides we've shown today. And uh, there's an upcoming thought paper that Braden has written based on this topic. Uh, some of the themes you've seen in the webinar will be uh, talked about in this paper and a whole lot more. Uh, we are, we're going to send you all a free copy for attending uh, as a thank you. Uh, hopefully it's been rewarding for you. This is a theme on, on the war for innovation, the need to, to innovate or, or you might, your company might die is one we will be revisiting. Uh, so please do check back on Imaginatic's website and on our blog uh, for continuing coverage and content of this very important theme. And with that, uh, I want to thank everyone for coming. Hopefully it's been a, a wonderful session for you as well. Uh, you feel free to reach out to either of us with further questions or comments. And we look forward to seeing you back here again for the next webinar. Thanks again, everyone. Thanks, Braden. Thank you, everyone.